right in the context of where we are in Colossians, we're going to talk about the topic of the mortification of sin. Maybe a fitting topic for this morning, given the fact that we've probably in varying ways been tested differently as far as our patience goes in terms of dealing with the the snow and these things. But we're going to deal with this situation, this, this topic, in a topical fashion. Now, I need to just sort of say this up front. There are some misconceptions misconceptions about topical preaching. Um, Topical preaching that starts with a passage and then launches to a subject completely different from what the passage deals with and never returns to the Bible isn't topical preaching. I'm not even sure what to call that. Topical preaching that is grounded in Scripture is expository in nature, and exposition just means explanation, is very fitting, it's helpful, you can do topical sermons on the holiness of God, Um, For example, we may even do a topical series on the family when we get to verse 18 in Colossians 3. So topical sermons have their place. They should not make up the whole of the the preaching diet, but they have a place as a small portion in it. And as we look at this topic, the mortification of sin, I know that for many of you this is really going to be review. I'm not going to say anything new. I don't have any new formulas to the mortification of sin and And in many respects, you guys have studied this. It's going to be review for some of you. For others, it may be new ground. But we'll we'll see that as we go. And and as you kind of work through some works to to study on the issue of this mortification of sin, the the pursuit of holiness by Jerry Bridges is very helpful, the vanishing conscience by John MacArthur, and of course, the mortification of sin by John Owen, although I would suggest it's probably not wise to start with John Owen's work You need to kind of whet the appetite a little bit before I think you dive into that. So here's where we're going. We're going to look at what mortification is. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in mortification. We're going to talk about what happens when we persist in sin. We're going to look at repentance, cautions, and then some strategies that we can employ as we endeavor to put the deeds of the flesh to death. Before we get going, though, I want to answer the question, why mortification? Why spend any time on this? And the, really, the answer is because of your joy. You see, sin is the antithesis of joy. And so when you cater to the flesh and give in to the flesh and lose that battle with the flesh, you're ultimately forfeiting joy and blessing. You're also uh, affecting even the glory of God. And so to kind of bring that out, John 15, 10, and 11, listen to this. It says, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. See, the Lord was intimately concerned with the joy of the believer. He is intimately concerned with the joy of the believer. So mortification is one of the pieces of the pie that needs to be in place in order for you to know the fullness of joy in the Christian life. Psalm 119, 1 and 2 says, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies, who seek Him with all their heart. See, those whose way is blameless are those who are walking in obedience to Scripture. Obedience to Scripture requires that you mortify the flesh, that you mortify sin. And when you walk in a way that's blameless, There is great blessing and great joy in the Christian life. So blamelessness yields blessedness. Blamelessness requires mortification. Now, we're all in different places here. Some of you are firing on all cylinders. You're walking. You're mortifying the flesh. You're you're putting the deeds of the flesh to death. Others may be less focused at this time. I just want this to be an encouragement to you, an encouragement to get back in the race if that's the case, uh, some, some fuel for the, for the fire to go after this with all that you have. So if you're in Colossians, if you would, just open to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to basically ground the context of this in Colossians uh, 3 verse 5 and verse 8. And I want you to keep in mind the context. Last week we looked at the importance of seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That's the starting point as a Christian, as a believer, for all holiness. All pursuit of holiness starts with setting your mind on the things above. But you'll notice what Paul does in verse 5. After establishing that fact, he goes right into, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. 
Look down at verse 8. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. And so... As we endeavor to seek the things above, the natural byproduct of having done that is to put the deeds of the flesh to death. The KGV in verse 5 says, mortify therefore your members. And so that's where we really get this word mortification from. Jerry Bridges in The Pursuit of Holiness uses a dictionary definition for mortification. It says, to destroy the strength, vitality, or functioning of, to subdue or deaden. So mortification in that sense is to destroy sin's strength, its vitality, it's to subdue it, it's to kill it. And in sanctification, it's really made up of both putting on and putting off. In sanctification, there's both the putting on of the right things and the putting off of the wrong things. And so when you have this putting off and putting on, you really have two sides of the same coin. The positive pursuit of holiness requires mortification. These things go hand in hand. They're inseparable. And so mortification emphasizes the putting off aspect of sanctification. Listen to Ephesians 5, 3 and 4. It says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So it's very clear that there isn't even to be impurity or immorality or greed named among us as believers. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So mortification requires abstaining from certain things, in this case sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And listen to Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. In that particular case, sanctification is a prerequisite for even being able to see the Lord. Now we understand that sanctification is grounded in justification. And so if you have been justified, declared righteous by God, then you will be growing in Christ. But the point is clear. Pursue it. Go after it. And one of the things that I need to deal with is the reality that mortifying the flesh is really our responsibility. There's sort of a a teaching out there that says what we need to do as we work to pursue holiness is just let go and let God. We're just going to passively let go, give this over to Christ, and we'll just wait for Him to deal with it. And that's not the way Scripture deals with this issue. In mortification, you're an active agent in this process. You are required to actively put to death the deeds of the flesh. The imperatives of Scripture place the responsibility on your shoulders. If Scripture commands us to do something, the implication is that we need to respond to that. And of course, with the Spirit in you as a believer, you have everything needed in order to respond to those commands. Consider Romans 6, 1 through 11. It lays out the theological foundation that the believer is in fact dead to sin, no longer a slave to sin. Verse 11 even says... So consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. After establishing that fact in verses 12 and 13, Paul then goes on to say, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. The implication is, even though you're dead to sin, you can still allow sin to reign in your mortal body. You can still allow sin to control you and to influence your actions and desires. Verse 13, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So you can let sin reign in your mortal body with the result that you obey its lusts. You can either present your body and its members to sin or to God. Responsibility is clearly placed upon the believer to respond to these commands of Scripture. Consider Ephesians 4.28. It says, He who steals must steal no longer. In other words, stop stealing. It's very simple. Stop stealing, but rather he must labor, performing with his hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. John Owen in The Mortification of Sin writes, 
even while we claim the meritorious mortification of our sin through the work of the cross of Christ, and though implantation of our new life in Christ is in opposition to and destructive of the expression of sin, sin remains, acts, and works in the best of believers while we are yet in this world. It must be our constant daily duty to mortify it. So our responsibility is to go after this thing by the Spirit within us. Now I want to illustrate a tension because as you think through sanctification, you're probably wrestling with, okay, is it me that sanctifies? Is it God that sanctifies? Who's doing this work in sanctification? And so there's a bit of a tension here. And if you want, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and I want to illustrate this for you. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7, Paul's really dealing with the, the, the Corinthians as they're saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. They're aligning themselves with specific teachers that they have preference over. And Paul's responding to them saying, the teacher is nothing. Ultimately, it's God who causes the growth. And so in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, Paul writes, What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. And as you apply that to the context of sanctification, you can know that you cannot cause your sanctification to grow. You do not function in the one, as the one who makes yourself grow. God does that work. But the reality is that you need the water. You have a plant that's been given to you in faith and your job is to till the soil, water the plant. And as you do so, God will cause that growth to take place. And so even though God is the one who is sovereign over your growth in sanctification, you are a, a major contributor to that fact. Now, if you're in Christ, naturally you will grow because God will make sure that you do. But at the same time, you have the ability as one indwelt by the Spirit with the Word of God to be able to strive and push and press the envelope toward holiness. 2 Corinthians 9.6 says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And that's in the context of giving. But as you sow to the Spirit in your life, as you feed and nourish your soul with Scripture, as you spend time with the Lord in prayer, you are sowing to the Spirit and you will then reap bountifully from the Spirit. So believers have the responsibility of mortifying sin. This is something that we have to engage in as believers. Now, it might do us some good to just kind of get a little bit of a feel for what the deeds of the flesh are. So listen to Galatians five nineteen through 21. It says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that really gives us a grocery list of deeds of the flesh which we can engage in and which need to be mortified. Now this really brings us to the means of mortification. And I need to say right up front, it's a grace endeavored work. This is not something that you do in your own strength. This is not something you do in your own effort. This is a spirit wrought work in you. So though it's your responsibility, the means by which you mortify the flesh is the Holy Spirit. It is by the Holy Spirit that you put to death the deeds of the flesh. And if you would, just turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, looking at verses 12 and 13. Paul has already made it very clear that the only way that you are Christ's is if you have the Spirit of Christ in you. And so now he fleshes out the implication of having Christ in you. In verse 12 it says, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And it's interesting, in my studies today, or this week, 
The you must die there at the end of verse 13 is not a call to repentance. Paul's not saying that if you are living according to the flesh, you must repent and therefore be baptized into the death of Christ, be united with Christ, and then raised with Christ. What he's saying is, if you continue down this road of living according to the flesh, you will in fact die a spiritual death, eternal separation from God. And so this is a serious endeavor. It clearly marks that putting to death the deeds of the flesh is a mark of a believer. And so putting to death the deeds of the flesh is evidence that you are in Christ and have the indwelling spirit. The promise is that if by the spirit you are mortifying the flesh, then you will live. And so mortification becomes a means of assurance. And that's what Peter was getting at in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Supplying your faith with these requires positively putting on these virtues. But it also requires that you simultaneously put off what opposes them. And then he goes on and says in verses 8 and 9, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. And so we, we know that if we are not putting to death the deeds of the flesh, and sin does have a grip and a hold on our heart, then we are naturally going to lack assurance of our salvation. Now, in Romans 8.13, there's a warning. It says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. So again, if your life is characterized by an unbroken pattern of fulfilling the sinful desires of your heart, then you are living according to the flesh, and Scripture's clear, you will die. If your life direction is not characterized by continually and gradually putting to death the deeds of the flesh, then you are going to die. And of course, again, this death is eternal separation from God. The warning is clear. If you're not continually and gradually putting to death the deeds of the flesh, then you don't have Christ, you don't have His Spirit, and you are headed to an eternity of judgment. And the the solution is very simple if that's where you are. It's hard, but it's simple. You need to flee to Christ. We sang it this morning. Christ makes an end to the sin of the believer. When we come to Christ and we embrace Him as our Lord and Savior, our sin is made an end to. It's finished. So the question then remains, how is it by the Spirit that the believer mortifies their sin? Well, if you would, just turn over to Galatians 5.16. And as you study this, I know you're, you're, you're wrestling with the question, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? On the one hand, it's very simple. I know oftentimes when I go to study and I pick up a commentary and I want to see what someone's written on what does it mean to walk by the Spirit, you never really get the answer you're looking for because you kind of want them to make it just like really crystal clear. And it's just, it's simple and we'll work through it a little bit here. Galatians 5.16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's a promise. If you walk by the Spirit, you won't carry out the desire of the flesh. So walking by the Spirit is, a, is the exact opposite of walking by the flesh. There's really two ways to walk. You can either walk by the Spirit or you can walk by the flesh. When you're walking by the flesh, what are you doing? You're obeying the flesh's desires. So if we know that walking by the flesh and walking by the Spirit are two polar opposites, then walking by the Spirit is to walk in obedience to the Spirit. It's to fulfill the desires of the Spirit. And we know that the desires are in us with new hearts, but also we know the desires of the Spirit from the Scriptures. Therefore, walking by the Spirit means to walk in obedience to the Spirit's desires, to be under His control. It's to be under His influence. So walking according to the Spirit's desire results in not carrying out the desire of the flesh. Now, walk is an imperative. It's, a, it's a, an imperative that's in the present tense. You are to continually always ever be walking in the Spirit. And as a believer, you were to actively do this. 
Walking by the Spirit is not a passive endeavor. It's not, again, a let go and let God thing. This is something that we actively do as believers. We walk by the Spirit. How do we do that? We fill our minds with the Scriptures. We set our minds on the things above. We let the Word of Christ dwell within us richly. We, we endeavor to um, practice deeds of love and self-sacrifice. So it's active dependence upon the Spirit for His enabling power. There's an understanding that you cannot do what it is that you need to do. Jesus said that in John 15, 5, apart from me you can do nothing. So you know that whatever it is that you have to do in the Christian life, you need God's enabling grace to do that. So the first step to walking by the Spirit, after of course having the Spirit, is to know that you can't do that in your own strength. You can't do what it is that you need to do apart from the Spirit empowering you to do it. So the first step is active dependence upon the Spirit for His enabling power. And then again, that you pursue the things above, pursue things of eternal value, that you seek the things above, Colossians 3.1. That you dwell on things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent, and worthy of praise, Philippians 4, eight, And of course, as we said before, that you sow to the Spirit. Sow to the Spirit through the Scriptures, sow to the Spirit through prayer, deeds of sacrificial love. These are ways that we can cultivate a more Spirit-filled life. And of course, when we fail to do this, because inevitably we will, we know that we're constrained to sin. We need to confess it as sin. We need to say, Father, I haven't been seeking the things above. I haven't been sowing to the Spirit. I haven't been walking by the Spirit's power. I've been walking by the flesh. I've been earthly minded. Will you forgive me? And we know from 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the means of mortification is by the Spirit. You can't do this without the Spirit. It's impossible. And that's why mortifying the flesh, the pursuit of holiness, is a Spirit-led, grace-directed endeavor. John Owen writes, All other ways of mortification are in vain. Men may attempt this work based upon other principles, but they will come short. It is a work of the Spirit, and it is by Him alone that we are to experience victory. Mortification from a self-strength carried on by ways of self-invention to the end of a self-righteousness is the soul and substance of all false religion in the world. And so, of course, we need the Spirit to empower us for this work. Now, what happens when a believer persists in sin? I'm going to give you three. First of all, you grieve the Holy Spirit. When you persist in sin, when I persist in sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Why don't you just flip over there just briefly. It's dealing particularly with sin of the the mouth, sin with words, sin with how we speak. And so Ephesians 4, 29 through 32 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And so when we sin, in this context with how we speak, we grieve the Holy Spirit. To grieve the Holy Spirit is to grieve God. And if you're in Christ, then you love God. And so grieving the heart of God as a believer in Christ is not something that we enjoy doing. You're also at risk of being hardened. If you look at Hebrews 3, 12 through 15... It talks about what sin does in its deceitfulness and hardening the heart. So Hebrews 3, 12 through 15, it says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Verse 13, But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. So sin hardens the heart. 
Sin hardens the heart towards our loved ones. Sin hardens the heart towards the scriptures. Sin hardens the heart towards our Lord. It can breed indifference. It can make us spiritually lethargic. And this is why it's crucial that if today you hear his voice and you know that you're struggling with a particular sin, if you hear his voice today, then confess that sin to God and repent and get back in that place where your heart can be nourished by the word and the spirit. The third thing is you will be disciplined. Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. And this is kind of a double-edged sword, because in all honesty, being disciplined by God is a good thing. It's evidence, number one, that you're a son, a daughter of, of God. But it's also a means of actually the fruit of righteousness being produced in your life. So if you look at Hebrews 12, verse 5, it says, My son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Verse 8. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, We had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, so that we may share His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And so... If we persist in sin, it's not likely that God is going to discipline us for every single sin we commit. But when we persist in a particular pattern of sin, there's no question that God will use discipline in our lives to bring about the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Of course, that discipline is sorrowful for the moment, but it is joyful in the end because it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And it's evidence that you are, in fact, a son or daughter of God. If you have received the discipline of the Lord, then you know you're in Christ. And God will not hand you over to your sin and let you go. He is going to pursue you. So this passage teaches that if you don't experience discipline from God when you sin, then you are not his child. But if you have found yourself in a particular pattern of sin or you have sinned in a particularly presumptuous manner, then you should expect God's discipline. And again, this is a good thing. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. So God's discipline brings about Christ's likeness in our lives. And while it's sorrowful, after you've been trained by it, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So three things there that I've given you that happens when we persist in sin. We grieve the Holy Spirit. We risk hardening our heart. And we invite the Father's discipline upon our lives. Now what I want to do is transition to a particular issue, which is repentance. Because in the context of mortification, in the context of dealing with our sin before God, repentance is crucial to have a a right understanding of what it is. And we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 7 if you want to turn there. Now, repentance really means a change in mind or a change in heart. It's to have a complete heart change toward sin. It results from a sorrow that is directed to God. And what it does is it sees that sin is first and foremost against Him. So repentance begins with understanding first and foremost that when we sin, it's against God. Even if we've sinned against a loved one, that sin is first and foremost against God because He is our Creator. Now Psalm 51 records the repentance of David after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband Uriah. Nathan had confronted him and Nathan had told him, you're the man, through an illustration that showed that David was in fact the man who had acted wickedly and unjustly. And so he was confronted with his sin and in Psalm 51.4 he says, against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So David knew that when he had sinned, it was against God first and foremost whom he had sinned against. And so repentance really begins there. It begins with a sorrow directed toward God because you know that you've sinned against your father. 
Repentance results when an individual understands that their sin is against God and when this is accompanied by sorrow, and it results in a changed mind toward one's sin and a zeal to make things right. When you've come to the place of repentance, you're finished with whatever it was that you were not finished with. You've come to the place where you're done with that. You want to be as far away from that as you possibly can. That's the heart change. You have a change in disposition. And salvation is the clearest example of that because when you didn't know Christ, you didn't have a love for Christ. When you didn't know Christ, you didn't have a love for His Word. When you didn't know Christ, you didn't have a love for His glory. When you came to Christ, since that day, your love for Him, His Word, and His glory has ever been increasing because you have had a heart change toward who Christ is. And so repentance is a changed mind, a changed heart toward one's sin. Now in 2 Corinthians 7, 8-11, through 11, you really have in the New Testament, probably the clearest description of what repentance is. But I want to give you a little bit of context here. Paul loved the church at Corinth. He loved the church. In fact, 2 Corinthians is oftentimes called the the pastoral epistle, even more so than 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, because it deals with a pastor's heart. He had given his life to this church. He had served this church. He had loved this church. And false teachers went in, undermined his ministry, undermined his credibility. And ultimately, they ended up following the false teachers. And Paul was extremely hurt. He invested nearly two years of his life in that church. And some of the Corinthians aligned themselves with these false teachers who were attacking Paul's credibility, his ministry, his character. And so what Paul did in response to this is he wrote what's called the severe letter. We don't have that letter in the canon. It's not not scripture in that sense. But he wrote a letter to uh, the church at Corinth and he chastised them. It was a severe letter. He was very harsh with them. He used strong language with them. He chastised them for their disloyalty. He called them to repentance. And so he wrote this, this, this letter. He sent it with Titus to Corinth. And it even says in, uh, that he regretted it initially when he had first sent the letter. He initially regretted it because I think when you, you look at the severity of the letter, he was questioning whether or not it was right to have sent it. This is kind of like that email you wish you could get back. You know, you, you, you labor over it, you write it, you think you're there, you click send, and then all of a sudden you start to think about it a little bit, and you're like, I don't know if I should have sent that. And so initially Paul did have some regret about sending the letter, yet Titus returned to Paul with a good report. And so Titus had taken the letter to Corinth, the Corinthians had read it, and they had actually been brought to a godly sorrow that produced repentance. And so, of course, Paul was overjoyed. And so again, these verses are going to provide for us really the clearest description of repentance and what it is in the New Testament. It says there, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. And so when Paul penned that letter, it wasn't their sorrow he was after. He was after their repentance. He knew sorrow needed to start, but it had to be a sorrow according to the will of God, which leads to repentance. And so Paul rejoiced at the report from Titus because the Corinthians had been made sorrowful to that point. They had been made sorrowful to the point of a changed heart, a changed mind. So sorrow, which leads to repentance, is sorrow that is according to the will of God. There's going to be two kinds of sorrow as we work through this. And for it to be the kind of sorrow that is according to the will of God, it couldn't be self-pity. It couldn't be regret. It couldn't be sorrow because one got caught. It couldn't be wounded pride. And it couldn't be manufactured remorse. It had to be a spirit-wrought sorrow in response to their sin. It had to be sorrow resulting from the understanding that they had sinned against the Holy God. They had assaulted their relationship with their Heavenly Father. They had attacked God's man as far as the one who planted the church for them and was an apostle of Jesus Christ. They had grieved God. They needed to be restored to God. At this point in time, they weren't defending themselves. They didn't see themselves as victims. They didn't justify their behavior. They were ready to say with David, against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil 
in your sight. And so this is a, a sorrow producing repentance without regret. Look at verse 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so there's no regret in genuine repentance. When you come to the place where there is genuine repentance of heart, there is absolutely no regret. You are rejoicing that your eyes have been opened to that particular issue. You are rejoicing that your heart has changed to that particular sin. Commenting on this verse, John MacArthur writes, True biblical repentance is not psychological, emotional human remorse, seeking merely to relieve stress and improve one's circumstances. Though it inevitably, inevitably produces the fruit of a changed life, it is not behavioral, but spiritual. The sorrow of the world, remorse, wounded pride, self-pity, unfulfilled hopes, has no healing power, no transforming, saving, or redeeming capability. It produces guilt, shame, resentment, anguish, despair, depression, hopelessness, even as in the case of Judas, death. And so, genuine repentance is made up of a godly sorrow directed toward God, which produces a change in heart toward one's sin, and it leaves behind all of the, the selfish entanglements that go along with sin, like shame, resentment, anguish, despair, depression. And then in verse 11, you actually have the fruit of repentance, in verse 11 there it says, Behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. And so godly sorrow leading to repentance produces earnestness. And this earnestness results in vindication. This is a desire to let anyone know who's been impacted by your sin that you've made it right. If you've sinned and it's affected anybody, if it's a public sin, whatever the case is, at that point in time, if you're genuinely repentant, you're at a point where you're ready to say, it was me, I sinned against God, I did the wrong thing, I'm making it right. And so it comes with vindication. It also comes with indignation. Indignation toward their sin. See, when we come to that place where we're genuinely sorrowful, a sorrow that leads to repentance, we are angry over our sin. We are finished with that sin. We no longer want to entangle ourselves in that sin. And we are now ready to flee and abstain from that immorality. It also produces fear, having understood the greatness of their sin against God. There was fear, fear that they had sinned against God and fear that they would never, ever sin in that particular way again. There was also longing, longing for restoration with Paul, longing for restoration with God. And there was zeal. This is a love for what's right and a hate for what's wrong. You see that in the Lord when he cleared the temple. He loved God and loved his house so much that his hatred for what was taking place there drove him to cast all of it out. That's a zeal, a love for what's right and a hate for what's wrong. And it brings about an avenging of wrong. They wanted justice and they wanted restitution. They wanted to make sure that this thing was made right, that Paul was put back in his proper place as the founding pastor of that church as well as an apostle of Jesus Christ. They wanted his character restored. They wanted to make sure everyone knew that what was being said about Paul was not true. They wanted justice. And so to kind of summarize this, there's a sorrow that leads to repentance and is according to the will of God. And it is a sorrow direct, directed toward God for one's sin. This sorrow produces a repentance without regret which leads to salvation. And repentance is a changed mind toward your sin. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. You're no longer at that place anymore. You're no longer at the place where you're regarding the particular sin in your heart. You're, you're beyond that. You're done with that and you're finished with it. You want it out. And you're no longer scheming for an opportunity to indulge in it. Such a heart change that you hate it and are indignant toward it. That's really what is the stuff of repentance. 
Now, we're, gonna, we're ramping up towards some strategies here. And I want to give you some cautions before we get to those strategies. First, don't forget the cross. Don't forget the atonement. It's finished. Your sin is paid for. The certificate of debt is nailed to the cross. This is not something that you're doing in any way, shape, or form to contribute to what Christ has done there. It's done. What this is about is the glory of God. What this is about is your joy, your effectiveness in in ministry, your effectiveness in the body of Christ. Flee from penance. Remember, it's not about your sorrow. It's not the measure of your sorrow. It's not the quantity of your sorrow or the quality. The issue is that you need to have a sorrow that's directed toward God. It's going to come in varying degrees. Sometimes you're going to sin, and there's going to be tears associated with the the conviction of that sin. Sometimes not. That's not the point. The issue is there's sorrow that directs you to God. There's a sorrow that you've sinned against God. You're not clinging to self-justification and all that other stuff. You're at a point where you want to make it right, and you want to flee immorality. Remember your dependence upon the Spirit. This is a grace-driven endeavor. Again, you can't do this on your own. And I say this because having gone down this road, I've gotten into that place where I was really functioning with a man-centered sanctification. I was really relying on my own strength, really relying on my own ingenuity. And in the end, it was very frustrating. And I found myself struggling with things like penance, struggling with trying to pray a prayer that God might find a, a, a reasonable enough prayer to, to accept on behalf of my offense, all of that's got to go. This is a spirit-led endeavor. It doesn't come with a... The Lord's yoke is easy and His burden is light. This is not to come as a load. This is to come as encouragement, fuel. Flee morbid introspection. And there's a tension here. We need to flee morbid introspection. But the tension is this. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? If you're focused on your heart in this pursuit, you're going to spin out of control. You can't have your eyes so morbidly focused on your own heart, but you certainly have to watch over it. The issue is, though, set your mind on Christ, set your focus on Christ, seek the things above, and He'll give you the wisdom to watch over your heart. Fix the eyes of your heart on Him, and He will give you the wisdom you need. And remember, no temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 And lastly, humility. This is, a, this is a, a pursuit that requires humility. God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. We need His grace. So humility needs to characterize our disposition toward God, our disposition towards our own sin. We need to understand our dependence upon the Spirit. So, you're dead to sin. You know that. We work through that. Seek the things above where Christ is. That's the starting point. That's the launching pad. Now come some strategies. Number one, take drastic measures. Turn to Matthew 5. Take drastic measures. In Matthew 5, we're going to read verses 29 and 30. We really have teaching right from the Lord Jesus Christ that we need to take drastic measures with our sin. It says, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now we all know this is not calling for self-mutilation. That's probably the first statement we we hear whenever that passage is read. It's not calling for self-mutilation. We know that. Sin is a hard issue. You could pluck out the eye, you could cut off the hand, and there would still be sin in the heart. So you can't solve the problem that way. That said, listen to this. Would you not sin less if your eyes were plucked out? 
You'd have to say yes to that. You'd have to. So the point is clear. Take drastic measures. I'm not advocating plucking out your eyes. All I'm saying is, take drastic measures with your sin. Be vigilant in your war against the flesh. Be ruthless. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. I once heard a a story about a pastor. A young man in his church had come to him. And this young man had come to his pastor and had said, I'm struggling with what I'm looking at on the internet. And so his pastor was there. He asked him, what should I do? His pastor said, come with me. They get into the car. They drive back to his house. His pastor says to him, go upstairs and get your computer. He goes upstairs. He gets his computer. And when he comes out, his pastor hands him a baseball bat. And the message was clear. If that's going to be the thing that causes you to stumble, then you need to get rid of it. You need to destroy it. You need to dismantle it. And so, as it pertains to strategy, you need to feel free and encouraged to take drastic measures against your sin. Secondly, know your enemy. And I'm going to read this quote from John Owen. It's a fairly long quote, but if you stick with it, I'm sure you'll find that it's helpful. This is know your enemy. We need to be intimately acquainted with the ways, wiles, methods, advantages, and occasions which give lust its success. This is how men deal with their enemies. They search out their plans, ponder their goals, and consider how and by what means they have prevailed over them in the past. Then they can be defeated. Without this kind of strategic thinking, warfare is very primitive. Those who indeed mortify lust deal with it in this way. Even when lust is not enticing and seducing, they consider, while at leisure, this is still our enemy, this is his way and his methods, these are his advantages, this is the way he has prevailed, and he will do this if he is not prevented." One of the choicest and most important parts of spiritual wisdom is to find out the subtleties, policies, and depths of any indwelling sin. To consider where its greatest strength lies, how it uses occasions, opportunities, and temptations to gain an advantage. We need to find out its pleas, pretenses, and reasonings and see what its strategies, disguises, and excuses are. We need to set the spirit against the craft of the old man to trace this serpent in all of its turning and windings and to bring its most secret tricks out in the open. We must learn to say, this is your usual method. I know what you're up to, so be always ready is the beginning of our warfare. I think it's an extremely helpful quote. Because what he's basically saying is you've got to know how sin seeks to, to get a hold on you. You've got to be able to see in advance the, the, the situations, the circumstances you're going to be placed in, which are going to give rise to temptation, and make adjustments accordingly. Here's another one. Remember the aftermath. When temptation comes, consider its result. Consider the aftermath of having indulged in the sin. Sin promises so much and delivers so little. Sin promises so much, but it is fleeting and momentary. And it comes with the sting of the conscience after the fact. It comes with the the attack on your relationship with God, your integrity before God. So remember the aftermath. When you sin, you forfeit blessing, joy. Remember the consequence of sin. This is a deterrent. And lastly... Let me highlight our most dangerous times. The most dangerous moments are when you're doing well. That is when sin is is most dangerous to you, when you are doing well. Because it's then that you let your guard down. That's the time when you are thinking things are okay. I can handle this. I can handle that. I can do this. Remember the Lord's words to Cain. Sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Genesis 4-7. So don't let your guard down. Now what I'll do is I'll just close with this quote. In summary, what we're looking at here is mortification. You cannot do this unless you're in Christ. 
It is a spirit-led endeavor. It's crucial because it relates to the glory of God. It relates to your joy. It affects your effectiveness in ministry. And it's only one side of the coin. We're only looking at the put-off. There is a put-on response as well, and Colossians deals with that. In verses 5 through 11, you have the put-off. In verses 12 through 17, you have this is what you should put on in its place. We're only looking at half of this work, this endeavor. John Owen writes, There may doubtless be times of wonderful success by the Spirit and grace of Christ, and such a great victory that a man may have almost constant triumph over it. But the utter killing and destruction of it we cannot expect in this life. Paul, who was a choice saint and a pattern for all believers, in faith, love, and all the fruits of the Spirit, who had no equal in the world, himself said, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect. He still had a lowly body as we have, which must be changed by the great power of Christ at last. We are complete only in Christ, not in ourselves. And so you have to understand, sin will frustrate you. And it will probably until glorification. I say probably, it will until glorification. But the reality is that we have everything that we need, everything pertaining to life and godliness. The Spirit is in us. We are free, slaves to righteousness. We're dead to sin. And we now have everything that we need to live the fullness of the Christian life to the glory of God for fullness of joy and blessing and effectiveness in the cause of Christ. And so I just want to encourage you. My desire is for this not to be a burden to you. My desire for this is not to load you up, but to be an encouragement. If there's conviction, normally conviction comes with a desire to make it right. We looked at what results from repentance, earnestness, vindication, zeal, longing. My desire is that this would produce that in each of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you and we just uh, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, we just thank you so much that you made an end to our sin. We thank you for your spirit that you've set us free from sin, enslaved us to righteousness. Lord, I just pray that you would give us a, a renewed zeal and vigor to pursue holiness, that we would see that as far more satisfying and far more valuable and far more enjoyable than anything the, the, the flesh cries out for. Lord, give us deep desire for your word, deep desire for fellowship with you in prayer. We thank you that you have made an end to our sin, that we are complete in Christ, and we pray that you would just bless us as we now follow in response to your word in pursuing holiness and walking by your spirit. In Christ's name, amen.